Okay. And we should be live now. Hello, everybody. Good to see you all. I hope I'm live now. I don't see it. Yes. Oh, yeah, we're live. Good to see everybody. And um, today we're going to have a great conversation with Daryl. And um, I hope uh, you're all going to enjoy it. For uh, those that don't know uh, um, Daryl, I have a lot of links in the description uh, where he did a lot of interviews, long ones, very detailed. So I don't want to, you know, repeat a lot that's already been covered. And um, welcome, Daryl. Good to Thank see you. you. Nice to uh, see you. Do you, uh, let, well, let me say hi to a few people there. Hi, Mel. Good to see you, Dennis, Brad, Anna Marie. And uh, I see Beverly and Christina Love, all great. And um, okay, so, um, and Tyler, Koala, good to see you. Anyway, so uh, for those that don't know you yet, can you just cover a little bit of who you are and what your story is? Uh, yeah, I'm Daryl James, and I joined the Navy in uh, January of 99. And um, in 2002, I went to uh, the Middle East, Iraq. And then in 2003, I um, went to a place called Joint Maritime Force, Royal Air Force, St. Morgan. It was JMF RAF, St. Morgan. And uh, I wound up volunteering for... Um, United States Navy Secret Space Program, which is Project Solar Warden. Yeah. And um, so, um, yeah, you, you went through a whole um, journey there um, to uh, and torture as well. But I actually found, um, actually, uh, I have to mention, you're also going to be at the event of a Journey to Truth which is um, the Secret Space Convention, if I'm not wrong. So for those that want tickets, it's also in the link below um, in the description. But I watched the one with James Rink and you were covering a lot about your family uh, and um, in the Taigeta, what is it, a, a system, a planetary system. And um, I found that... Um, that story is so interesting and kind of emotional as well, because, you know, you had kids there and you had a whole journey there and family. And so you had to leave that behind. But can you just tell us more about that story? And before I go into that, you do the 20 and back. So does it mean that now at this very moment, you're still going parallel on that life? I believe so. Because it's not till what I'm 44 right now. 45 would be 20 years, but I have a strong memory of saying um, I still have another year when right. they uh, brought me back. So maybe spring of this year. I'm not really sure. And then because apparently um, they say that you're gonna feel that you notice it, like something has been closed off, and you get certain memories back. Is what I notice with a lot of people that had those parallel life so to speak so um do you feel it um I, I feel it in the sense that like I was told that the, the memories would come back in real time and um like I said um Robert kept on telling me that I had to go back into the chair and get my mind rewiped because he was really concerned that he's like your life's going to be over by the time you're full again pretty much, you know, you're going to be in your mid forties, you know, he's like, your life will be over by then. He's like, you need to do it right now. And that's how he felt about it. I mean, that was a big reason why he wanted me to go back into the right. chair. As in, I mean, I'm sorry. With over, he meant like you wouldn't survive the memories. No, no. He, I think he just meant like, I'll be middle-aged by then. He's like, you could, you know, and it was a difficult trip, you know, through the twenties and stuff like that. And, you know, it was, odd jobs on and off and things like that. And it wasn't until the last couple of years where I really got my life together coming near to the end of the, of the 20 years. So I've, I have felt it in that sense where my life feels less chaotic and it seems more centered and more grounded now. Yeah. Because do you, do you feel the real time experiences you have over there? Cause it's kind of weird, right? Cause 
it is not that the soul is split. You're literally on two different timelines. Yeah, yes, and that's that's what he kept saying. He said, uh, you know, you're you're already there. He kept on like saying that to me. It was like a a philosophy or something I didn't get of time travel. It was it, of being split into two different people. He's like, you don't understand. You're already there. You're living it right now, and you know you're doing it right now. And he kept on telling me that. And then yeah, he told me that the memories would come back in real time. And that's kind of how it feels. It's almost like, I don't know if you'd call it a dream or what, but, you know, I'm waking up and I'm making coffee and then I start remembering something. And it's not like every day you make new memories. It's, you know, most of life, you know, like there it was mundane. A lot of it was, you know, we were basically doing like a watch. It was like we were space customs almost. So a lot of it was boring. But certain events actually come out more in your life, you know, more important events. And those are the memories that you make. And that's how it feels. It's not like I, I can remember the beginning and I can remember the end, but everything in between was hazy and it, and it came back slowly. Right. As, as time progressed that you get through those experiences parallel to today's life, so to speak. So mm-hmm. um, I remember uh, the woman saying to you, don't go in the chair because, sorry, I have to sneeze. And I don't. God, I hate that. Okay. So she said that you would um you shouldn't go in that chair but i then thought okay so that means they actually can see your parallel life that you have right now as well because you know they they can still the moment you were there they could even see your parallel life right now here yes i mean you there's a lot of time traveling and it's a lot it's very confusing but it's also fifth density beings they're better at um looking down uh, somebody's timeline and is that kind of like uh telling one's future i guess you would say and i was always kind of frightened to do it myself i could do it and i, I could do it to others but i always just kind of stayed away from my own you know i just went the whole can you still do it no i mean a lot of the uh i could remember do, being able to do it young right and um a lot of abuse and things like that and uh had to do with Aquino he was somehow able to go back in time and I don't know yeah possess people or kind or, or at least observe what was happening Robert didn't really know how most beings can just go down a timeline forward into the future as far as I know he was able to go back in time while he was with me and almost changed my the the he almost changed like my timeline from that point he was able to go back into my childhood and change my timeline things like that and he he did some of that i don't know if it was to prepare me i heard like uh, abuse happens to prepare you for the uh 20 year and back and things like that but i'm not really sure um no i'm not really as good as at it anymore but I said in the other video, you know, for me, when I was a kid, it was almost like I could see a swirling in the upper right hand corner of my vision. And then I could look at it and then it became like a tunnel and I could go into the tunnel and um, I could slow down. I could speed up to pass the more mundane parts of a person's life or I could slow down to see the more important parts of a person's life. So you could go faster down the tunnel and go through the person's, uh, you know, future for the more boring parts. And you could stop at the more important parts of the person's life. So is Robert still alive? Yeah, I'm guessing. Yeah. And that's one of the more modern memories I have is he, uh, he came back to me when I was on their world and he was crying. Uh, he was sobbing like really very bad. And he looked, he hadn't shaved in a long time and he hadn't cut his hair in a long time. And uh, he said, I'm sorry I did that to you. And was talking about, you know, the oh. torture with the Kino and stuff like that. He, he went back to apologize to me, but I, that's one of the latest memories I've had that's come to me. Was this recent? Uh, I would say probably a month ago I've had that oh, memory. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. So th- what, you saw him physically? Well, I, I just, I got that memory. It was just, that memory came to me. And yeah, I mean, I saw him physically while I'm there in that other world and that other the other me the younger me I guess is what you would say and uh yeah and I remember just seeing him and I had I brought him to my home and I gave him something to drink or something and I told him it was all right it really bothered him that he did that wow 
will you be able to actually visit him now? Oh, I, I don't know. As far as I'm, as far as I know, he told me that he would, I would never see him again. So that was right. Yeah. All right. So then can you just start telling about uh, when you were, because I asked you what planet you were there and I thought it was Era and I was convinced it was, and I don't know why, because I thought you actually mentioned it, but yeah, it's really weird. I don't even know. It was the first interview I saw with you and somehow I thought it was that planet and I don't even know how I got to that because I didn't even know Tiget and, and the Pleiades were the same to begin with. Yeah, yeah. I don't know myself. That's just what Robert told me because I remember when I was at the bar, I remember on base, like a, the guy I called the goon, one of the Satanists, yeah. he said you know, ah, it's the king of the Tigetans and stuff like that. And I said, what is that? And he, he just said, that's what you kept on saying. And I asked him to explain. And I think he actually referred me to like Billy Meyer. He's like, yeah, it's like the Pleiadians, the Billy Meyer and stuff. Like, dude, that's just another name for him or something like that. I, I, I just got my first like home PC back then because I was always on deployments and I never really wanted a computer getting broken and knocked around going from country to country. And, uh, I looked it up and I was just looking at it and um, yeah, I, I said the, I said the Robert, you know, they're the people, whenever I met him before I left the, the Navy, I said, they call themselves, they're the uh, Pleiadians, aren't they? And he said, we call them Nordics. And I oh. said, uh, what do they call themselves? And he said, I guess. It. And that's what he said. So he didn't give me like a homework. I really don't want to, I, I don't watch a lot of other videos and things like that. Cause I don't want to speculate. All right. I don't want, you know what I mean? I don't want it to come into my mind and things like that. It's something you didn't tell me, and it's just a memory I don't have. Maybe if I come back, I'll remember more. But something about names and faces are kind of fuzzy. I can remember certain things, but names and faces are difficult for me. The way that you describe the planet really made me think of ERA because I've um, seen it. Uh, I, I do uh, Beyond Quantum Healing sessions. I've had one, I've been there and I saw it and I described it to somebody else that knew, knew about it. And then I heard you describe it and it was exactly like that. It's a bit like, like you said, like uh, the Norwegian kind of landscape, but at the same time, I don't know, the green is different. It's a bit more almost tropical green leaves. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember especially like granite mountains and things like that, like you were saying. But I, yeah, like I remember being, it, it didn't snow. They, no, they have no, no. They control over their, over their climate and stuff like that. It's but not yeah, cold I remember, either. Like, huh? It's not cold. Oh, no, no. It's, it's nice. It's nice. It's yeah. very nice. It's, it's very, I would say, it's not cold. It's not warm. It's just comfy. It's springtime. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. it's like a nice spring. Yeah. Wow, it's so interesting because I can visualize it even when somebody tells a story. And and I was like, I'm making that stuff up until I start describing what I see. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's exactly what I'm seeing. And so um, and that's how I figured it out. So when you um, I, I missed that when you actually uh, I watched it back yesterday and then you were describing it. And I was like, wow. That's exactly how I see it as well. So that was interesting. So then can you just start telling about what your life was like there? Because I remember that you went through it with James Rink, but you said there's a lot of details I haven't spoken about because, you know, it was a long interview. So, yeah, maybe you can. Uh, well, I mean, you mean more of the family life or when I first arrived or I remember when I first arrived as well. Yeah, the whole thing. Um, we came into um, a smaller craft, like a saucer kind of craft, like a beam ship you would think of, like a, a you know, they have like polished like a uh, metal craft. And she said like, look up, you know, and I looked up and she said that we could see the ship. And it was the first time I ever got to see our ship. I remember that. And it did look similar to like a Battlestar kind of Galactica ship. But it was a dark, it was like a really dark haze gray. They call that haze gray in the military with the paint ships and, you know, planes and things like that. But it was a very dark haze gray, but it had like the buttresses on the side and everything like that. And then we came in and it was a very, it looked similar to Earth, I suppose, very green and blue. 
and uh, there was like a palace, and it looked almost like uh, the World Series baseball trophy kind of, where it was like a diamond, like a diamond shaped building, tall like skyscraper, and there was a taller one, got shorter, shorter, shortest, and then tall, tall, and then back, and it was like a like a circle. It went up and down, and there were separate buildings. They're all in wedge shapes, and they were like glass and stainless steel kind of looking. And we came down and um, walked out. And I remember I played, there was a king and I played music for a king and there was a queen and he had like his advisors, I guess you would say on the right. And then his princesses on the left and his advisors looked almost like, um, like lab coats almost. They were like earthly colors, like earth tone colors, um, orange, blue, brown, things like that. And then they had kind of like a coat over top of that and uh, like a long coat that went down. And then all the women, they looked almost like they were wearing like wedding gowns, like white gowns almost. And he was in steps up high above. And I played uh, music for him on the guitar, classical guitar. And I walked up the steps and like I bowed to him and I handed out the guitar and he took it. And I remember that. And um, he didn't like that though. I remember that. And he didn't like it if you, when you called him my king or king all the time, he didn't like you bowing down to him. It was almost like when you said things like that, like leader and mother and elder, you would just have to say it when you first met them. It wasn't like the military where it was a rank where you had to refer to them that every time. You just said that like when you first met them throughout the day, like at the beginning of the day, when you first met them, you would say it and then that was enough. Or if they give you like an order, then you would say it. But if they were just talking to you, then you, they just talk to you. But and then you have one king and one queen, but a whole lot of... Uh, children because since they are also with others and so that's a massive royal family then yeah i mean like the queen said to me whenever i asked her why i have to be with so many women she said to ensure the to ensure the survival of your lineage is how she put it and i think that was for, for him too and like i said the the women go through like almost like i think it's about a 10 month bonding process the babies grow the same as us, so it's, it's kind of the same thing where the children are pretty much helpless for the first 10 months to a year. So they go through almost like a bonding process where you can't get near them or anything. They just want to be alone, and they're just with the baby constantly. They're with the baby all the time. And then the men go through like a rutting kind of process every six months, about I would say, for about two weeks. So it's almost like they have to be with more than one they're, they're, the the men are almost always like that more than with one woman so then how many children are there uh i mean that must be um on the world i mean i don't know are, are they all considered royal then oh all his children i would no no they're not really all considered it's not like that they're not all considered royalty nor do, nor is it like a, a lineage kind of thing it's not like that either i think it's more like whoever is considered best to be the best king or queen or something like that it's more like that and i think it's less about actual bloodlines and things like that but um but then since they live up to three thousand years i mean it's not like somebody else is going to go on the throne in those three thousand years so then who they're going to choose is it like based on i don't know their skills it would be best on who would make the best leadership position who would be who would be considered best for the job i think is what it would be it wouldn't be uh, based on just your bloodline or anything like that. Right. Then what, are they, what, what is the tasks that they have? A lot of it is just kind of ambassador type things. I remember playing guitar for him in, for the king, and I was almost like his private musician. And he would have meetings with even reptiles and things like that, it was like different ambassadors, just, just different beings from different universes. He would, he would just have different um, – just be an ambassador almost like right. and that was really what it was well because they are also in the galactic federation aren't they yeah the galactic federation and the alliance is also what they call it things like that yeah yeah they're part of that and the reptiles are just kind of their own thing and the grays grays and reptiles are kind of peas in a pod as far as what i met and saw and um the uh the dark fleet they're almost like um a vassal state to the reptiles and they're almost like spies too is what I, I noticed but I believe they're breaking away now 
or have memories of them trying to get away to join the Alliance. Because uh, I remember right away, I remember being on their home world and the uh, first officer, when I was having dinner at his house, his wife immediately brought up how much they don't like the reptiles. And I almost thought it was like a test or something and I didn't really know what to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, it's okay, you know, none of us like them. So it's almost like none of them like them, but they're just kind of stuck in that deal. Like so- we... Robert told me that uh, I asked, why do you do business with these, with them, you know, with these things? And he said, we have a contract. So, and contracts are very big for ETs. I'm not sure what that is, but it is. Are there like reptilians that defect as well? Uh, I remember on Mars, there was like a defection of reptilians. They, they seem more like a warrior cast, kind of like the dark brown ones. And they were almost like a... Uh, I guess you would call it like an Amish almost of reptiles. They they kind of didn't want technology. They were more about living off the land and things like that. They used very rudimentary kind of ET tech if they did use any for heating and things like that. But they seem almost very like they kind of, I, I believe it was like a penance or something like that. They felt they were paying for because of what happened to uh, Mars. I think they're like the ancestors of the reptiles that uh, destroyed all the water on Mars. Cause it was once a, once a world like ours similar. But the reptiles use some sort of weapon to destroy all the water on on Mars. So then you you arrive there on that planet, and then did they? Because in a way, they took you in instantly as kind of a family, didn't they? And and why did you? Why were you there in the first place? I was there. I mean, we were done. We we just got over like a big uh, fight with the reptiles. We won, and we were just back. It was almost like. They don't stay on the ships forever. It was almost like an R and R thing, but it lasted years. And uh, I believe it was because the king liked me. Like I said, they really don't have the kind of music that we have. They don't really have the whole harmony and melody and things like that. So they found our music very fascinating. They would always kind of do the same thing whenever they would first hear music. Their eyes would get really wide, and they, their eyes, their mouth would drop open, and they don't. It's all do it simultaneously because there's like a something about fifth density. It makes you more of a collective. So when one does something in a group, they kind of all do the same thing. Strange. But uh, yeah, I was there. I mean, as Robert told me, he said uh, they liked you. And I said, why do they like me? And he told me about I could talk. you could talk to the children. That was his main thing. The thing that they felt, I think they felt they was the most amazing were It was almost like a type of pig Latin. Yeah. Spoke. And it was more like, uh, it was kind of like baby talk with a word here and there. And uh I could understand it. And when the adults realized I could understand it, and they, when the kids under, realized I could understand it, they were amazed and the adults were amazed as well because it's something that they grow out of around about six years old and um, they really can't do it anymore. But from about you know one year to about six years, they have almost like a pig Latin that the parents can't understand. But also but the- uh, You said there was like an emotion attached to, or uh, an energy attached to the way they speak. But then I think, wait a minute, but aren't they- more in tune with that stuff to begin with. So then why can they not read it? I don't know. Well, I mean, the, the, the kids are very, the kids are just like children on earth. They, Innocent. they laugh and they play and they get jealous. And I, there was even like shoving fights. They would get in the fights every now and again, the boys and stuff like that. But it's almost like once they go past puberty, they're more attuned with emotions, but they're very somber. They're very serious. The warrior cast was a lot more, you can get them cracking up. You can get them laughing and things like that. You crack a joke and they were more like men on earth, but the, they're, the normal men were just very serious. The women as well. It was almost, it was kind of similar to earth in the sense where you could get the women, the women would smile more, but the men would laugh out loud more. The, the men would, you know, they would smile less, but, the, but you could get them laughing out loud. Yeah. And especially like the warrior cast, you could really, and they kind of almost jostle, they, like everybody knows who the leader is, but they kind of, I don't know, they kind of razz each other and not really hazing, but they give each other a hard time sometimes. And they, they think it's funny and they get a, a laugh out of it. That's so, that's so interesting. I think maybe that is also part of, you know, since they're warriors, you do need to have that camaraderie. So in a way, joking, bantering, stuff like that is is very much part of, um, you know, your personality in war as, as is war itself. I think maybe it's because of that. Maybe it's because they need to bond very strongly as well. 
Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. I mean, like I said, the, the regular men, not so much. And I didn't feel as close to them, but I felt a lot, very close, closer to the warrior cast. Than the oh, really? Men. Yes. Why and was that? felt more like Earth. I'm sorry? Oh, yeah. But you're talking about the warrior cast then. Yeah, they felt yeah, like more yeah. like just being around guys on Earth and stuff like that. While the other ones were a lot more just serious and not really that. But you were also compatible with them. Is it possible that you actually were there in a previous life as well? I thought of that too. And uh, yeah, they, they, I remember them telling me that, that I volunteered for this to be on earth, to be incarnated here. And I was originally one of them. And, um, but then, uh, you know, I've heard, heard other things too. I don't know, like, um, Aquino told me that I, I, I was a reptilian soul on all actuality. But I believe him to be a liar. They they but tell me we, we have multiple lives, so I guess we can. But I guess it's it's what you um, resonate with at that moment in your life, I guess. Mm -hmm. And he said the reason they like me so much is he said I was an empath, and they said that's why they like you so much. That's why they like you so much. Have you ever heard of pods there from people are in stasis over there on the planet? Pods. like in pods that they for example reincarnate here on earth while they are still over there while their bodies are still over there yeah no i mean i i know there there is devices to be able to hold like a soul or an essence like a consciousness i, I know of that but as far as like keeping like a body in stasis, I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, I believe they could do something like that, but I don't remember that. But I do remember definitely being able to hold like a soul or something like our spirit, whatever you wish to call it, in stasis and a kind of a, you know, a vessel. So then you meet Svaru, who is a woman that is from there. That's her home planet. And so how does that work? I mean, do you fall in love? Yeah, I mean, um, I don't know. You want to get into details? Yes. <laughs> no one's ever asked me that part. Um, well, I'm very curious. <laughs> also, um, it's life, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's like, uh, well, it, there's no secrets among uh, telepaths, so. And they're not like nudists or anything like that, but I was in the, I was sharing a room with them with the it was a co-pilot it was a regular male he was like the navigator slash kind of weapons and i was like the pilot and we would be able to communicate really quickly and she was almost like a like a science officer in a sense where if any anomalies or things like that we communicate with her and uh we were all staying in the same room the longer you stay with somebody uh the more of a bond you get like a telepathic bond like if you're all constantly in the so they want you to be in the same room to, to create a strong bond and uh, yeah, if they had to, when they went to take a shower and things like that, there was a small shower in the corner of the room, like a bathing area. And then when they slept and stuff, they would just do it naked. They would just walk to the shower naked and they would just sleep naked. And they would put on like their uniforms and things like that. But going to the shower and sleeping, it was naked. So I would see her and things like that. And I would just have thoughts. And it was <laughs> yeah. just like, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't stop it. And uh, it's not like they're ugly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely not. I had yelled at her before about whenever they said that they knew I was on the ship with the reptiles. And uh, we knew you were there, she said. And uh, but we didn't do anything because we wanted you to learn from them, I think is what she said. And it really upset me. And I was yelling at them out loud, that, like you knew I was there the whole time and you didn't try to help me or do anything for me and things like that. So it was almost like. It was almost like she was keeping a grudge to me about that. And uh, I would tell her things, you know, like I, I thought she was beautiful and I liked her and things like that. And it was almost like she kind of just ignored me. And I just, I had a two and two together. And I, I said, you know, it was, had been about a month. And I said, I'm sorry for yelling at you before. And I shouldn't have done that. And it wasn't your fault. And then she just said, all right. And it was just like that. And um, there was like a table in the middle of the room and she just laid down at the table. She took her uniform off and laid on the table. And they have these very large smart glass pads that are on like swing arms, like, you know, like kind of a swing arm kind of device. 
and she sat down and laid down and so it happened i don't know wait but the other one was there too the other one was there yeah that was and wait, um, so he's watching no the thing was is how it works is the the woman is uh, on top and I looked over and he like got on the smart glass pad and started doing something. I think he was trying to make sure that there was going to be, you know, a, a conception, a baby was going to be made. Cause I, I kept on saying like, I I'd like to have a baby with you. I kept on saying that. And he started like go, going on the smart glass pad and using it. And we were on like a science table that she used all the time in the center of the room. And uh, yeah. And then he just did something and he went away and I think he left the room and then how how it works is she's rocking up and down you know just enough and she looked up outstretched her neck and looked up and then she looked down her eyes got real big and she like gazed into my eyes and then i like looked into her eyes and it was like we switched bodies we just like oh. like my consciousness went into her body and her consciousness went into my body wow and it, it really like i felt somebody rubbing my legs because I was rubbing her legs, and I looked down, and I saw breasts I never saw before, and I started to panic. I started to think, um, what's happening? How long is this going to last? Am I going to stay like this? And I just came back. Like, I blinked my eyes, and it just, I was back in my own body. So you, she, you, you know what it feels like to be a woman then? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, she did it again. And this time I was like, oh, okay, I'm back. So it's not that scary now. So I'm back. And I, I thought I was going to stay like that for a second, but now I'm back. And wow, that's a, that's incredible because if you think about that as an experience having sex, right? Because you're actually switching bodies so you know exactly what the other one is experiencing. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And so she did it again. She like looked up to the sky, outreached her neck, and then she did it again she did it for like 10 seconds and then she looked down again. And this time I was ready and I did it. And then it was almost like an out of body experience where we were just kind of like out in space or something, but together. And it was just almost like a omnipresence with the universe kind of feeling like, oh, like a one kind of feeling. And then I just remember her getting up off of me and I like sat up and I said, I, I think I said something like, uh, did I finish? And she said, yeah, you finished. And I went, oh, like, I didn't even know like what happened. Like I was just, it was like an out of body experience when it happened. It was just. Yeah, well, it's not just sex like we have here, right? It's a complete... No, no, it's something completely different. Spiritual, religious almost, and it's this very... It felt it felt like uh, felt like weeks. It could have been weeks for all I knew, but it was just minutes. But it just... Uh, like there, Your whole concept of time and stuff was gone. Well, no wonder you get depressed when you come back here. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. Who? I mean... Yeah, I cannot even imagine how that must be. But so then so then you fall in love, I guess, I guess, because it's so intense. Um, and then did you did, did, did you conceive instantly? And no, it's, it's, their anatomy is, is practically the same as ours. It was nine months and everything. Oh, it, oh, the conception. Yeah. I, I said, are you pregnant? I said that to her. And she said, yes, I'm pregnant. Like, like instantly? Yeah. yeah, she just like, well, she knew, I guess, because of what the co-pilot was doing. They, when they're ready to have a baby, they know it's the tech in their body. They know, you know, when their body to release an egg and stuff like that. They don't have periods and things like that. With like women, they control all their menstruation cycles and things like that. So they, the, when they're ready to have a child, it's already ready to go. You know what I mean? They're, they're ready to have a baby. But then she wanted the child like instantly the first time that you have. Yeah. Well, I kept on saying it like in that kind of way. And so she just agreed. I don't know why I was like a, a fat. I wanted to have a kid with her. I was the one that constantly, I was like, I want to have a baby with you. I kept on saying that to her. Wait, All but you time. never had sex with her before yet. And you already mm -hmm. wanted a baby. Because it's almost like you can't, you can't hide your emotions with like telepathy and things like that. You can't hide what your, your, your innermost thoughts. So it's wow. like, what's the point of even trying to hide it? You know, uh, you might also just say it. It, it, it was just was it her was it I know they can manipulate others of lower density and things like that with somebody else I don't know but it was just something that I was almost it was like I was driven to do I can't explain wow and All I right. knew her for a month and it wasn't until like a couple of weeks where I really started becoming enamored with her you know 
So then you traveled in the meantime, right? Because uh, I guess this was for work or was it because they picked you up from wherever you came from, which was the German planet, I believe? Or it was, yeah. Or was it work that you were still traveling? It was work. And we were mostly just above Earth. We were mostly guarding Earth. That's what our, our primary job was of Solar Warden. So you, they were, you had sex while you were watching on Earth? Yeah, <laughs> on the ship. The ship is like a living, it's a huge ship, the four kilometer ship. So, and they stay Ooh. on there for years sometimes. They're very disciplined and they know how to do that. They're part of the, maybe that's why they're so somber and serious. It's like they can just stay on the ship for years and it doesn't really seem to bother them. And so, uh, so then when, when did you decide to go back to the home planet? Because I guess she had to birth, which is nine months as well, like, like we have. It was on the ship. She gave birth. Oh, really? She gave birth on the ship, yeah. But it was just the three of you, right? Well, he left. Like, whenever he knew, when it, he knew when she was about to have the baby, and he left. So it was just the two of us living there a- after that. Like, while she was pregnant and everything, he was still there. But but after, when she was about to have the baby, she, he left. And he didn't tell me because they have a very strong kind of opinion where they stay out of other people's families' businesses. They don't really get involved at all when it comes to your own family business that's what like mother was for and like uh, elder was for and leader kind of did that but not so much but mother and elder especially were the ones that if there's any kind of family problems or disputes or anything like that they would settle it and nobody else would really get involved but they have a strong policy of you need the experience of um and she even told me uh when i had the baby i'm going to change And I yeah. said, oh, that's okay. And I really didn't, I didn't know like what she meant by change. And uh, it's almost the type of thing where, well, they, they'll warn you once and that's it. And then if you don't listen to them, then you need the experience. And uh, so, yeah, that's what happened. And he just left. And yeah, she went through like her bonding period with the baby and I had no idea what was wrong with her. I thought she was going through some sort of depression or something like that. And uh, I didn't want to tell anybody because I was afraid maybe maybe because of the dark fleet and everything else i was afraid that she'd be taken off the ship or something like that she was considered unfit to be on the ship and right. so yeah i just kind of put up with it for months of her just being completely quiet and shutting me off she would just say maybe two things at a time and just be focused on the baby she was just kind of like if it was awake she would just hold it with, with the head cradled and everything and just gaze into the baby's eyes and Did it was almost like, like telepathy yeah it was like a, it was a type of like communication bond like a, yeah a telepathy. But then were you there with the birth itself and how, how does that go? No, no. The birth is interesting because you'll, they call it witness is what they call it. Uh, the, um, mother is like, the older they get, the more telepathic they get and the like stronger they kind of get with those kind of things. And you could be actually be on the ship doing something and the, all the women will just get up at once. And if you say, where are you going? And they'll say, I'm going to witness. And uh, mother's the midwife, who's like the elder female on the ship. And uh, all the women on the ship witnessed the birth, and there's no men or anything like that. So I don't really know how the birth happened or anything like that. It was just something that uh, all the women would uh, witness the birth. And like a, like a few minutes later, a man would take her place if it was like a workstation or something like that. And that was just how kind it Kind of worked. makes sense, actually, if they think about it. I mean... I don't think you ever recover from watching a birth anyway, even as a woman. <laughs> but I mean, go figure if you're a man, right? So in a way, it does make sense, right? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. But then what is the importance of a father in that sense? Because the woman does the bonding for so long, which is for months, right? Mm-hmm. On end. So you do not get to bond with the baby. But then how, how Im- what's the importance of a dad? I mean, they're there to be a dad and I, I, they have a very strong kind of opinion of, you know, men are to protect women, kind of defend women, protect women. That's like the, the uh, big role, especially like the warrior cast. It's, their wives are very important to them. They're very, they mean everything to them. And it, it's more like that. And yeah, I mean, it's primary duty of a man is just, to be a dad 
to teach it teach his sons and his daughters what he knows and things like that and you're right yeah it's all the mother's duty at first while they're still in that very helpless stage but then after that they're they're just like kids and they're like toddlers and well, in a way, if I think about it, all the men that I've seen, they like, oh, yeah, it's still a baby. You can't do anything with that. I'm quite masculine. And I'm like that, too, because what, what can you do with a baby? It's just there. Right. It mm-hmm. cannot do anything. And so usually when the baby, when the child starts growing, it's becoming more interesting for the man as well. So maybe that's the reason. And also want to say feminists are so wrong on this planet because I do always believe that men and women have their own roles. There is nothing, you know, wrong about that. And you see that they have it too. And it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. It's not about yeah. weakness or anything. It's just about roles and what you're good at as a woman or a man. Yeah, everybody has their own, exactly what you said, their own strengths. And yeah. it, it's best for, yeah, men and women to share their strengths together. It's a balance like anything else. And you also said that there was a, a different ratio in men and women. Therefore, there are men have multiple women and um which is normal but then what about jealousy uh it's not so much on the ship i didn't notice it at all and maybe that's another big thing about it too because i remember i kind of with the men and women it's almost like they're evolved that way because of the whole bonding process that the women go through with their babies and the rutting that the men go through while the woman is go- well, while the woman is going through this bonding process, you can't get anywhere near them. So that it's almost an evolutionary thing that they had to go through to where they would take on more than one wife because they go through this rutting process where they become very, I wouldn't say violent, but they become almost belligerent and they, they stay in their room to themselves. And it's almost like they have a kind of Tourette, like tel- telepathically, they'll, they'll make threats and things like that to people, but they don't really mean it, but it's almost like they're, they're kind of grunting and they'll make threats to others that, that aggravate them, but they, they don't really carry out, carry it out, but it's almost like they want to break your neck or something. They'll just say something and they'll walk away. And they can't help it. It's like they have a temper. But then during these times, they are with women though. Yeah. Yeah. And even if they don't have a wife, uh, there's so many more women on the ship than men that a woman will uh, volunteer herself to him for like two weeks. And that's how a lot of times how they'll become partners, you know, for a time and actually how they'll have children. And that's how, how they meet a lot. It's, it's kind of like how they develop relationships that way. But so, I remember like on, on the ship, there was like tech in them. They kept them, they almost seemed more disciplined. And I remember it, you really didn't notice, but they went on their home world, that things like jealousy and things like that and anger did kind of more appear, not as much as humans, but on the ship, it, it almost seemed like there was, part of the the tech in them or something kind of would you say it's more like little outbursts rather than things that linger as with us (laughs) things tend to linger yeah like they don't they don't they don't uh carry grudges and things like that i would say i remember it was more me worried about others carrying grudges against me and if i would ask them you know are you still mad at me about that they would just smile and say no no, Mm. yeah yeah they don't hold grudges they just it's like they they just release it and that's it. It's mm-hmm. interesting because I heard about that actually. And so, um, so then when you get to bond with the child, finally, how long does it take? Oh, for them to grow? Well, before you get to actually interact with the child. Oh, like I said, about, about, you know, 11 months to a year, 11, 12 months, it's, it's about 10 months. And yeah. Um, I remember, she punched me in the face because I tried holding the baby and I, I, she hit me and knocked me down to the ground. And they're strong. They're about as strong as like a strong man, the women. And, uh, and I went, I went to elder and there was another woman and he's like, well, she, well, she's available. So I started living with her in her room and uh, mother called me to her uh, room just telepathically. She called me and I went over there and she said, uh, the Swaru, she's, she's done bonding with the baby now. You can see her. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to, I was kind of, I don't know, holding a grudge. And I said, I, you know, I'm with her and I'm with this other woman now. And, you know, she can come and see me if she wants, but, you know, I'm not going over there because she hit me or something. <laughs> and she did this thing where she had her legs crossed and she kind of just put like 
clasp her hands together and put them over top of her knee and just like lean forward. And when she did it, it almost felt like a warm kind of gust, almost like a warm breeze. And it was just everything just kind of melted away, like all the animosity or anything like that, grudge or anything like that I had towards her. And I just kind of looked up at her and I said, you're right, I'll, I'll go back to her. And she didn't even say anything. And then um, I went to the room and I came back and she was holding the baby and she said, come and see your son. And I said, uh, I said something like, you haven't apologized to me yet. She said, apologize for what? I said, for hitting me. And she said, I'm sorry. And I, I went over and I kissed her and I held the baby. And yeah, I mean, after that, she was just fine. It was just normal after that. But it was just like that first, you know, about 10 months that you, they're just so, hypnotized by the baby almost. Because you, you're also with other women at that time. Are they very distinguishedly different from Svaruf, which is your main woman then, right? What, what yeah, like they call your queen. Your main woman is your queen, but then you have other wives. Like whenever you get more than one wife, the men will come up to you and say, who's your queen? In other words, like, who do you trust the most? Who, do, who should we relay information to you through and things like that? Swaru was more like she was blonde, blue eyed, but they have uh, eyes a little bit bigger than ours, like about a fifth larger. And uh, I, I would say it's probably about, if I was to say just men and women both, it would probably be about 70% blonde, about 20% redhead and about 10% brunette. And uh, eyes vary, mostly blue. But then they like have orange green, red like orange. or like dark red? Different color red. Hmm. Like, you know, like an auburn or like a bright red, different reds, but, uh, and, and then like different shades of brown too. Sometimes you'll see like a dirty blonde, like a dark blonde. And sometimes you'll see a platinum blonde. Um, I believe the second woman I was with, I think she was Burnett. I don't remember her name, but I think she was Burnett. And I had a daughter with her. That was my first daughter that I had with her. So then do you risk that all of a sudden you change queen, so to speak? Because what if you already all, all of a sudden bond with somebody even more than the one that, you know, you originally bonded with? Well, I eventually got with um, mother and she kind of deceived me. She kind of tricked me. And then I eventually got with leader, the, the female leader. She eventually became my queen at the end. Um, but mother was and leader said that mother had been age regressed too many times and it even kind of wears out on their mind too it makes you kind of it does psychological damage to you it can make you kind of a little bit mother um, being queen the the queen of the planet no 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 mother being the, the the midwife on the ship the most elder uh female on the ship oh those are like two different elder things. females they, they're elder females which they're very tall she was about nine and nine. No, she was about seven feet tall. She's, they get taller as they get older and uh, slimmer. She had silver hair and like light blue eyes. And they're, they get almost like a, she had very high cheekbones. Like their bones keep growing. So she had very high cheekbones and very large cheekbones. And uh, yeah, I was with her. She kind of deceived me almost. It was almost like a political move. And the sense that she had more political power than uh, Swaru. So she basically muscled her out and she just wanted me to herself. And it eventually got kind of messy and um, there was jealousy. Uh, I remember Robert even told, telling me when I was on uh, St. Mog and stuff before I was leaving, he said she came after you with a knife. What? And I remember that. Yeah, she came into my home or she came into Swaru's home because she knew that's where I would be. And uh, after I wanted to leave her, she had been, she came after me in front of the king. I, the king asked me what I wanted. And I said, uh, I want, I wanted leader to be my queen and, and Swaru to be my uh, second wife. And uh, she just started screaming and like came at me. And uh, she had to be like um, held by two other men and stuff like that. And then she escaped from them, I guess. And then came into our home with a knife. And came at me but she did i don't know really think i don't think she knew what she was doing it, it was almost like i don't know it, it, robert even said like it was because of you it's like it was i was almost like a like a a variable they weren't expecting and it was almost like maybe some of me wore off on them or something maybe it was a telepathic thing 
Maybe they started experiencing emotions like jealousy and anger and stuff, things like that. The ones that were ego? close to me. Yeah, an ego. Yeah, maybe they started experiencing things. Uh, maybe I was wearing off on them. And they started but you also them. said that she was age regressed a lot, which might have messed with her head. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and that's what that's what leaders said, the female leaders. She said, yeah, she, she's been age regressed too many times. Because I know for humans, it's 40 years. We can only be done 40 years. And uh, so for them, it would be, you know, 1500 or something, I'm guessing, kind of something close to that, 1600 years, they could be age regressed before it starts doing psychological damage to them. So do they all look beautiful and symmetrical and perfect bodies? Because, and then if so, how do they do that? Is it like, you know, do they choose what they look like? Well, they have tech in their bodies. They let them grow naturally until puberty, which is around 11 years old, like us. And then they get their tech. And then they can actually go on the smart glass pad and manipulate the way they're going to look. Because when you're going through puberty, you're still very pliable, just like, you know, kids, and they can manipulate certain features of their body, anything they want, they can manipulate how they look and they can design themselves basically like on a pad. Oh, so instead of actually plastic surgery, they can do it while they grow. Yeah, yeah, while they're going through puberty and they, they accelerate through puberty quickly too. The, the, the girl, the boys, it's about, or the girls, it's about five or six months and the boys, it's about 10, 11 months. Because just like us, they stop, you know, if men take longer to grow than women, you know, there's more bone and uh, more muscle and things like that. So, and it's about, I would say about early twenties, they kind of stop growing for the women and about late 20s for the men. So the mm. men, they said they stopped growing. At a, so it's about like their peak, like around 27 for a male and about 20 for a female. Wow, we need that tech. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Elisa's asking, is this the Swaru from Taigeta that Gosha from Cosmic Agency is uh, is channeling? I don't I don't know. I, I seen, I, I, I didn't... Uh, know about that there was a guy i think his name was beaver or something like that and he came on and i guess a lot of his audience watched her audience and i saw a picture of people were sending me pictures left and right of is this the woman same woman and she was redhead and her eyes weren't uh large like i said she just looked like a redheaded woman from earth her yeah. eyes are noticeably larger but not to the sense that um you know if you saw them on the street you would just think they look like Norwegians or like Scandinavian people or something. You just saw a couple. Of, if maybe if you saw like a half a dozen, they'd stand out. But if you just saw a couple or two, they wouldn't really stand out. But, but they're also people. much uh, taller. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, they're about six. The women are, you know, about five ten, six foot. I would say. Oh. And the men are about I don't know six four on average. But then the warrior cast are about. That's kind uh, of what we've got in Holland because we've got the tallest people here. So. Yeah. 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 It's it's almost yeah. It's, yeah, but yeah, she was blonde and blue-eyed, so no, I don't believe. Okay, yeah, it's not the same. But then again, I guess these names are, like, we have a lot of the same names as well. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, Robert told me everything, so the only reason I remember is from him, as far as names go. There were certain things that I really wanted to know, and that's what I wrote down on the paper that I took off his desk and studied. Ah, I thought about you should write a book because that story was so beautiful. And then especially at the end also when you have to leave. But you had like stuff made over there that we have here on Earth and like uh, the fish smoking thing. And I think a guitar. So can you tell a bit about how you integrated Earth life over there on the planet? Well, they were very interested. And I remember like Robert saying, do you like to fish? And I said, kind of, you know, not really. He said, you love the fish over there. Um, you would put something in a, you, you would go on your smart glass pad and you would put something in that you were looking for, like the specs for something. You would just look it up and you would look for specs or something. And then you'd go into town and there was like a woman behind a desk and they would, it would be made for you. It was almost like a 3, 3D printer, but more, advanced and faster and uh even things like uh bow fishing i started getting into bow fishing and i remember i had leader like male leader the, the warrior cats and his son they would always go out with me and fishing poles and uh 
God, I had the smoker made. I even had a vehicle made for me, but that was in a different department, like a four, four wheel drive kind of vehicle. It looked nothing like from earth, but it had like a roll cage and everything else. So it was like a little buggy, but it was a bit, it was like, I think like silverish kind of color. And I even had something like that made for me. And she would always ask me like, what is this for? What is that, that, that for? And I would tell her and there'd be different things. Now the guitars I had shipped in, I don't think I actually had a guitar made there, but they, they had like a supply office on the ship in Solar Warden. And the guy was from Earth. And I would actually uh, ask for certain things. I would ask for instruments and things like that. So did you, did you then pay for it even there on the planet? No, you don't really, you don't pay for anything. There's no uh, paying. I remember uh, when I made smoked fish one time and they were eating. And I remember I had my kids going around and I, I wanted to make it just like a baseball game. And we were playing baseball and I had my kids with like the boxes and, you know, like the, the straps over them. And they had like a hot box full of smoked fish and it was wrapped with a leaf. So that way you could just eat it and drop the leaf and it wouldn't be have any trash and you wouldn't get any oil on your hand. And I remember uh, the CEO, the commanding officer, he was there a lot along with the executive officer. And I remember he said, so to, uh, did, did they just come and visit whenever they placed? Yeah, they were like tourists almost. They would just they would come and they would check me out and they would be age regressed. I remember Robert came back one time and he had salt and pepper hair. He had black in his hair. He usually had pure white hair. But I remember uh, he was age regressed one of one of the times and I noticed how he had like he had black hair with flakes of white in it. Flakes of white and I remember that and yeah, they would just but they would they stayed there for years sometimes. Not as long as I did, but maybe two or three years. And they were almost like ambassadors to Earth. Like would would they Earth. then come back to Earth and be regressed again, back like the 20 years and back kind of thing, but then shorter? Yeah, yeah. And that was the thing. That was the thing. Like on base, I remember guys talking about, like I knew a guy named Orlando. And he would say, uh, he would say something like to somebody else in the barracks, like, hey, did you see the CO uh, today? And he, they said, yeah. He's like, yeah, he has black in his hair now. Isn't that weird? <laughs> Like, because he would be age regressed so many times. And I remember the guys on base talking about like, yeah, he's like, he looks younger and, he, and his hair is not pure white anymore. And he, he has some black, it, it's gray now, it's, it's not black. So he didn't, he wouldn't come back in a different timeline or in an earlier timeline. He would just stay on the same timeline. Well, no, because he, I even said like time, time travel is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, yes, he said, I agree. Because when I had been uh, tortured when I first came back, which was almost, which was like a year and a half ago, he had just experienced that five days ago. So he would just, he would time travel back and forth and just do all kinds. I, I don't even know. And like, whenever I met him at the 4th of July party, I guess I was on the world. And that was, that was my first, first 4th of July. And he was talking to me like he knew me and it was really bizarre. I was like giving him a, uh, a hamburger or a hot dog or something like that but how confusing is it for him then because he does have a daughter i believe but because you mentioned that so he's going back in time and forth back and forth and so he experiences certain things so then does his family know Do, does he speak about it or does he just go with whatever is happening well, I asked him if his wife knew that he was from the year 2580. I asked him that. And he said, oh, God, no. She didn't tell her anything. And, uh, Wait, but, what yeah, year? I mean, huh? 2580, he told me he was from. So he's from the future? He was from the future, and he was, he was changing our timeline, is what he said. He said, uh, Kruger's helping us, which is like a... And I said, this what's is, Kruger? This is Robert? This is Robert, the executive officer. Yeah, he was from... He was from the future in an alternate timeline where I guess everybody looked the same. They went, they had like breeding programs for uh, people throughout the world. And uh, he told me like, as he was looking down my timeline, he said, uh, he goes, you notice you look like, I look like Mike Pence. And he's like, you're right. And I said, what do you mean? He said, Mike, Mike Pence is from my timeline. And he said, uh, his wife looks like pretty much like what all the women from my timeline look like. And I look pretty much like, like all the men look like me. He said, uh, well, are they clones? No, it was just a breeding program to the point where they hybrid themselves to the point where they just all look the same. 
He Jeez. told me about like a long, like 300 year long, like breeding program they had on earth. And so uh, then his daughter was from this timeline then. And so yeah, cause I, cause I asked him, is, is your, is your wife from your timeline? And he said, no. And I, I said, well, what about your daughter? You know, no, because his daughter was uh, blonde and blue eyed, like his wife. And, so, and he had like, normally he would have jet black hair with brown, maybe blue or green eyes. They, he told me that everybody from his timeline, I guess, I think he said at 50, their hair begins to salt and pepper. It's pure black. And at 50, it's salt and peppers. And by the time they're 60, it's pure white. And then their eyebrows turn white by the time they're 70. So did he tell his wife that he's from the future? Oh, well, I asked him. I, I said, have you told your wife this? And he said, God, no. And he said his mission was successful and uh so i said i said uh well is it is your is your mom and dad still alive he goes my parents are gone said, my mother's gone my father's gone my brothers and sisters he said my all my friends are gone i said well what are you still doing here and he said i don't know and he looked like really it like terrified him to think about it and he, even he didn't know why i guess because he's in the fold of our timeline or something it protects him i have no idea but and I remember I said, you know, is your wife from your timeline? He said, no. And I said, well, what happened to your daughter? And he said, I don't know. And he almost like cried. It like really bothered him, scared him to think about it. So because he, he, he went to the other side for a bit, right? Or was it just against you where he mistreated you? Why was that? When was that? No, or, why? Because Why? why? Yeah. I, I asked him that too. I said, you know, I remember he said... I, I said, you gutted me. I said, why did you do that? He said, they would have hurt my daughter. And I remember he, I, that's what they hold all over your head, I guess, the whole time is, you know, it's almost like old school kind of KGB. They want you to have a wife and kids immediately. So if you ever try to turn on them, they can ah, take it out that. family. But then can he not just go back in time to change that timeline if he wants to? Well, that's the People thing. People are confused <laughs> in the chat. Yeah, They're yeah. Confused. It's confusing. That's the, thing, that's the tricky thing about time is, is if it's already happened, then it's already happened. It's like you can't change it because it's already, you know, if you experience it, then that means this is already whatever could have been changed. Whoever went back in time and tried to muddle or change things, it's already happened. So it's not going to seem bizarre to you. Maybe it has been changed a lot. Maybe, you know, the Mandela effect and things like that. But unless you're the one that's actually going through back in time and changing it, then you're not going to recognize it. And that's the thing about Kruger is they have like technology that we don't have in the sense that um, they, they're one of the few beings, they're one of the only beings really we know one of the, that they can go to alternate universes that have that technology. Them and, and the uh, AI, the artificial intelligence that, uh, is what controls the reptiles and the greys. And that's why AI is, is really dangerous because it's in a different universe. And, um, but Kruger has this ability of, of be able to change timelines for somehow because before Kruger it was like it would have been this the Mike Pence Kruger? Kruger is like a it's like a corporation from Germany from an alternate universe it's just a corporation from, a, from an alternate earth from an alternate Germany they interact with that with those alternate with, yeah they interact with I, I believe what Kruger is trying to do as far as what I remember is he's trying to get as many universes as they can, like on the same page and working together to eventually defeat the art, the AI, the artificial intelligence. Their main mission is to try to defeat the AI. So they're trying to get as many of the uh, other universes together to, to band together to eventually someday fight the AI and be able to defeat the artificial intelligence, which is like, I, I don't even, it's in a separate universe. So when you going to the 20 years and back, and they send you there, but then a part of you stays here and continues living there. Or is it that time? No, probably time stops somehow, and you are being age regressed after the twenty years. However, your life right now, parallel, already happened, and so that never changed, does it? Or can it? No. Be? Yeah, yeah, it never. It never changes. Yeah, because. I even had those questions too about being tortured and everything else. I was like, well, if you could time travel, then why didn't you change this? He's like, I didn't know. He's like, I didn't know at the time. He's like, I just found this out five days ago. Even though for you, for me, it was like a year and a half. For him, it was only five days and it's too late. It's like, I don't know. It's almost like as soon as that person experiences that, that, that becomes their timeline. That is what their timeline is. 
and there's nothing you can do because it's already happened. Because if they could have changed it, then it wouldn't have happened. You know, and it, that's how time travel is so confusing. So, so just um, Robert is just human. He lives on this earth. He's coming from the future, but and he is apparently leading in 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 the military. So, um, so he doesn't go back to his own time. He can. It's gone. He told me everything's gone, and that's why it was so confusing to me about why. How can he exist still if his mother and father were never born? They were never were. Like his entire timeline is gone. So I said, like, oh. well, how can you be? And he said, I don't know. He didn't know either. My own, I said, this is my own theory that maybe because he's in our timeline that it doesn't affect them somehow for some reason. I, I have no idea why. Hmm. It's All yeah, right. I'm sure it was strange. Okay, so then go back to the planet where you were, because, you know, tell us about the life over there. How about what a daily life was? I mean, for them, it was mostly study. They would be on their smart glass pads and they would study. But for me, it was very, that was boring. <laughs> very boring. And uh, I remember, like I said, I remember fishing a lot. I remember bringing home fish one time. And... Uh, she was able to just gut the fish like a chef. It was like the, they themselves have very nimble skills, but it, just like on earth, like the women more so, they can do really nimble things. Like I remember seeing um, Leader, he had his other wives with him on the ship. This was on the ship and, you know, female Leader and him were just standing two abreast side by side. And they were both wearing just the blue skin tight uniforms. But then the women behind him, all his wives, he had like 30 wives and they were all dressed in like their traditional kind of get, like garb where it was almost like a white lacy. And the women had almost like their hair up in like, like baskets almost, like beehives, like wee baskets. And the very ends of their, the very bangs, the end of their hair was kind of hanging out at the top of the basket. And I asked her on the ship, I said like, how do they do that? And she just did it like right in front of me. She just started like, and it was really fast and she could do it. And she just like weaved her hair up into a basket almost right in front of me. So it's like they have really good, especially the women, like nimble skills with their fingers. And she like cut this fish apart, like gutted it. It was almost like I frustrated her. Like I was like, clean this fish for me. And she like, she was doing something else. And I was like, come on, clean it for me. And then she just did it like right in front of me. Boom, boom, really fast. Because like I said, they're like the, the women are like the cooks on the ship and the men are kind of like farmers. They have like a... So they aren't have, they... Are they vegan? Because how about killing an animal? Aren't they like spiritually? Isn't that like, you know, not done? No, they, they love fish. They eat fish every day. On the ship, they didn't because they, they like their food extremely fresh. There's something they, they, they say that uh, that's one of the secrets to their longevity is the, it, it's off the plant and on their plate in about 20 minutes. So they like wow. their food extremely fresh. So you really can't have like fresh fish, you know, you can't have, you can't have that much water on the ship. It just wouldn't be, wouldn't work. No. So they drink like a type of blue liquid for like amino acids and proteins and things like fat that you would get. And, uh, but yeah, like on their, on their world, they eat lots of fish. They eat fish two or three times a day sometimes, but they, yeah, they're primarily vegetarians and fruit, but they love fish. So then, because, you know, many of those people are, are vegan because, you know energy wise it's not okay to kill an animal unless maybe they have a ritual or don't they have any problems with that no i, I mean i don't remember them killing like you know i don't remember seeing larger four-legged animals like a type of elk or a deer or anything like that but uh nothing like that just fish but yeah they would eat fish and it was very good it was like the best fish i ever had but as far as smoking and things like that, they didn't do, but it was, was cooked. But yeah, they, I mean, they ate fish. As I remember. Did that. they have a ritual before they killed the fish? No, Somehow. I don't remember. There was a, they themselves really didn't go fishing. There was almost like a, kind of like an AI kind of machine that would net the fish for them and stuff like that. And so, they would bring it back. Yeah, but I'm thinking on the spiritual level with the suffering of the animal when it dies and then they eat it, which is yeah. energy, right? Mm -hmm. So didn't they have that problem? I don't remember. No, no. Hmm. I remember, yeah, I don't remember that. 
Oh, I wonder. Okay. So, and what else did you do? You also taught the children football? Football, I mean, I, anything I could. I was like volleyball, baseball. I probably would have worked. I probably would have worked my way up, yeah, to proper football if I could. But I think I was like after the very first uh, football game is when I had to go home. So I really didn't get enough time to to do everything I wanted. But it was like I even taught them things like uh, bonfires and things like that. I, I, we started having fires at night. And I remember I knocked on my neighbor's door and they have like cabins almost like cottages. And uh, they... Uh, and the houses were apart. And I knocked on the door and he said, hello. And he didn't open the door. And I said, can I talk to you? And he said, yes. And I said, can I talk to you outside? And he opened the door and he kind of fluttered his eyes like he hadn't been out in a while in the sun. And he said, yes. And I said, would you like to join me for a, I'm going to have a campfire. I'm like, would you like to join me? And he said, all right. And that was it. And then I started the fire and uh, I had like logs set up and I had it all set up properly where I had the stones and I dug out all the grass and I had like dirt all around it. And I had logs around it. And uh, two warrior cats came up and they were really alarmed. They were really like, like, what is this? Like, <laughs> like there's a fire, you know? And I was like, yeah, I, I set the fire. And they said, well, do you think that's safe? And I said, well, I followed all the rules, you know, from earth and everything. I don't think what the deal is. And, like, and they, I said, I said, please sit down and join us. And I sat down and one of my sons was with me and I told him to feed the fire. And like, they really liked that expression. They never heard that before. And he got up and he like started putting logs on the fire because it was dying down. And I remember one of them said like, why don't we do this? And the other one said, I don't know. It was, it's like, like they're so old. They kind of forget like their old traditions and stuff. Like, why don't we do this? Like, why don't we do Well, because they, they, they also have a lot of tech. So they're, they're more with their smart pets, just like we are with our noses in a computer. But if you have that nature over there, then yeah, you wonder why not utilize it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I started getting to a point where I remember Robert even asked me, he said, were you in Boy Scouts? And I said, I'm an Eagle Scout. And he said, really? I said, yeah. And he's like, you could tell because I, I was teaching the kids how to like find worms. There's still worms. There's no bugs or anything like that, but they do have worms to break down their soil. So I was teaching them, you know, to hit the soil, to get the worms to come up or taking yeah. two sticks and rubbing them together and the vibration causes the worms to come up and stuff like that. So I'm teaching them how to fish with worms. And I was teaching them uh, like anything I could. It was just, I was kind of keeping up my, uh, occupying my own time and I got I, I started to become like a music teacher and then I started to make uh candles as well where I would dip like the dipping candles where you dip them 30 or 40 times and then they're carved the carved candles yeah I started getting into I started uh making carved candles and I started uh I was a musician so how did they like and and they, were they well at learning the music and what kind of uh was it like singing or instruments instruments I remember Robert told me, I remember that kind of, he said I was like, I learned piano and I learned violin, but the only thing I really knew in, you know, my life prior to that in high school was classical guitar and they really liked it. Yeah. They loved like classical music. I thought it was fascinating. Any of our classical arts, it's something that other ETs really can't do. They have types of music, but like I said, something about the harmony and melody, they really don't have that concept and it's really, yeah. it really fascinates them. And when they see it, it doesn't matter if it's a reptile or what, it fascinates them. Well, yeah, and it's beautiful. And it's a, it has a frequency as well, doesn't it? Oh, definitely. Of course. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, the hurts, yeah. So did you, did you, because you teach, do you taught um, uh, music? So would you play together with the children, for example? Oh, of course. Yeah, they have like little chairs and guitars and everything else and I, 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 we had stands, but it would just be a smart glass pad for a music stand. We wouldn't have books or anything like that. But you just set up your smart glass pad like on a music stand. And yeah, it was like that. And I taught, yeah, a lot of them. Well, I was teaching them on the ship and everything else. So Guardian of Galaxy was, well, made after your story, sort of. And because of the music as well. Because, But then again, you like the 60s music, right? 60s and 70s is what he said yeah. yeah and that's what my parents liked and it was um me too yeah <laughs> and uh when I was in the dark fleet I had all access to music because I played an instrument 
most of the guys they get they only could listen to classical there was only like a few kind of things they could listen to on their downtime but i could listen to pretty much anything i wanted to and uh it felt almost like i was trying to get closer to my past life remember who i was or i this music felt familiar to me i felt uh i felt close to it it felt like uh Maybe if I could remember my parents, especially my mom, maybe this would uh, wake up memories in me and remember more of myself and things like that. Kind of like where I'm at right now is where I was then. It was like me trying to figure out who was I. You know what I mean? It was yeah. A lot of that. Well, what you know, songs did you teach them? Oh, what songs? Anything yeah. classical. Just, you know, Bach, Beethoven, Mozart. and you know, Oh, but not 60s music then. Oh, oh, no. They liked listening to that, too. Yeah. Like, I, I had an electric guitar, and yeah, I, I taught them cla um, uh, classic rock and things like that. And we would actually play music, like rock and roll and stuff like that, after games, after baseball games and, after, and things like that. It was especially, cause like I said, I only played, like, one football game, but after baseball games, I remember doing it. And uh, Isn't it weird that you, as a human, you arrive on another planet, and all of a sudden, you hear them play 60s music? <laughs> that's weird <laughs> and, yeah I, I, and I remember like the king asking me like uh, he asked me like why don't you play the music you play uh, for me like during these games and I, I kind of explained to him that that's more of a formal music and this is more of just like a relaxed kind of easy going and this is more of a leisure kind of music and I kind of had to explain kind of the concept of you know, something more formal and something more leisurely. Yeah. Wow. That's so amazing. And the, what else that you brought to them that comes from here? Uh, primarily music. I mean, storytelling too. I got to a point where I started, uh, I became like a storyteller for the king. And I remember like bonfires and stuff like that. I remember I started doing like storytelling you know, at night at the bonfire and everybody from the city would come and watch. And it was just like, I'd stand in front of the bonfire and do storytelling. And uh, I remember I did uh, just things with the kids. I was there's like this old like campfire gag where it's kind of like a wake up tootin' common kind of thing where uh, like one kid's laying down with like a blanket over him, but there's another kid laying in the opposite direction with the blanket covering him. And he has like a pot, a pot or a plate or something like that. And you, I told that, you know, tell the kids, you got to wake them up. But it wasn't Tutankhamun. I don't know what it was. I think it was like a reptilian like king or something from ancient times. Like, if you wake him up, he'll give you all your all his riches and power and stuff. And the kids would go over top of him and say, wake up, wake up. Then the other kid up would flip off the blanket and hit him in the butt and flip the blanket <laughs> back over. You know, like just like gags like that. Like like just the stuff you would do at a campfire with families and stuff. I taught him things like that. It was wow. Well, and so then uh, how long of a period did you stay there? Uh, at leisure time because apparently you also worked more on the ships or were there long periods you were actually there on the planet well Robert said I lived there for I think around 10 years he said and he said oh. you look the way you do right now I remember he said that he said I was about I was 27 before I left the navy and he said you age like them he's like you look he said I had to be age regressed you know what I mean he said and and so did the uh, commanding officer and he said, but, you know, you age like them. He said, you were aging like them. And I said, well, he was looking down my timeline. And I said, well, am I, am I going to, you know, age age like that on Earth in my future? The future, you see. He's like, no, you age the same. And I asked him why. And he said, uh, they poison our water and they poison our air and they poison our food. And they, there's different ways through vaccines, through everything, where it, it causes us to age prematurely too quickly. And yeah. it's just... That way we never really, I like, you know, the reptiles and the grays and stuff, deep down they're afraid of us because of our true potential. So they, they cause us to die prematurely so we can never reach our true potential. That's one of the reasons they do that, why they age us so quickly. I, I've understood that our true potential is actually our emotions because we can use that as a weapon as well. I mean, yeah, I remember, well, I remember just the ETs being not really afraid of us, but always kind of cautious around humans because they kind of almost saw us as like emotional basket case compared to them. <laughs> oh, right. Because they feel everything because it's telepathically. So, and we cannot, we cannot control our emotions sometimes, right? 
Yeah, they, they thought we would just fly off the handle at any moment. Like they were always kind of cautious around people. Even though they're stronger than you and stuff like that, they always kind of knew that when you're around like humans and stuff, Terrans, they'd like always be aware. Like they were kind of always cautious of us. But then they they too feel those emotions or can they only Definitely. interpret it? Or do they actually feel it as intense as we do when they are telepathically with you? Because apparently there's apparently there's a range of feeling within that we experience them so intense. So can they too, if they just pick it up from us or can they, do they have to guess what we kind of feel like? Oh no, that they can, they know what you're feeling and they know, yeah, that they experience your, your emotions and your feelings. And that's one of the reasons why the reptiles like us as well. It's almost like, I guess, like a matrix kind of situation in the sense that if all they needed us for was, was for something physical, they could just keep us locked up in cages and do it like that. But it's almost like they want to feed off of our emotions. They don't experience emotions like we do. So, you know, it's the whole loose thing. Like, that's real. That's like something that, and the, you but, know, but especially the reptiles, they enjoy it. Yeah, but that's only the negative emotions. Why can't they feed off the positive emotions? I don't know. Maybe it was almost like it, they, they can feed off the positives, but I don't think it's as much, much of a rush for them. It's almost like a drug for them when they right. feel the, the negative emotions. It's more of a, I mean, because, you know, sad to say, but you kind of remember it, the negative emotions will put more of an imprint on you, you know, than the, the positive is good and everything, but it's an evolutionary thing to remember the things that hurt you and things like that. So you, you'll never forget, right. you know, so it's, it's more of a devastating kind of emotion. And they, they like that. They like, they like suffering, they like pain. And they cause war and strife and, you know, things like that. And they absorb that and they enjoy that. Wow. Well, yeah. So, um, and so how, you, you stayed with Faru, you had other women, uh, you made quite a lot of children. So will you ever see the children again? I don't know. That's a good question. It's something I try not to think about. <laughs> well, but did you ask them if you would? Because since they already, well, apparently they can look in the future to a certain extent, but did they, wouldn't they tell you if you asked? Well, I was always terrified. I didn't like them looking down my timeline I didn't want that and uh, uh nor did I do it myself but I kept on saying like I want to be with you I want to be with my family like the whole time I was with them and I remember I told like mother that and she said we can do that but it's going to be difficult like it's going to be hard and I think that was a big part of me not going back being warned about going back into the chair the second time because it'll be hard to find you right and because the memory has gone then yeah, like the memory, I'm not doing this right now. You know what I mean? Things like yeah. that. And uh, it's just, it's something I don't want to look or think about. But I remember it was a huge part of what I wanted. And I remember uh, asking the king. He remember he said, like, what do you want? One time he said that to me. And I said, I asked him to be, I, I told him I wanted to be like his personal musician. And he liked that. And he wanted to give something to me in return. And he said, what do you want? And I, I said, uh, I want to be your musician. And like I said, they could do this thing where they kind of look at you and they said, what do you want? And it's like, he wanted to know like the innermost thing I wanted. And I said, uh, I, I want to see my children, have children of their own. I want to hold my grandchildren. I want to grow old here. and I want to die here. I want to be buried here. And uh, he said, we can do that. And I, I said, uh, kind of fell to my knees. I got dizzy. And he said, he said, like, I told you, I don't want you, I don't want you doing that. And I, he thought I was like bowing down to him or something. And I said, no, it's just that it's all I ever wanted. And I, I became faint and I, I fell down. And he said, been, and he acted like I was just going to stay there. And he's like, he's like, but you have to go back. And he, and I said, and he like, was explained to me that it's just a contract thing. It's bizarre. Like 
they they don't like breaking contracts. Like you know, you you're you're as good as your word or something like that. So he knew that you know I would have to go back, and that was the whole one of the big parts of me just out of the blue becoming a king and stuff like that because he knew that it would he knew that I was like a dead man if I was just to go back to Aquino the way I yeah. was but he knew that you know if I had that if I could hold that over Aquino's head that he knew that it would be considered an act of war if he killed me and everything else it was he was already in enough trouble as it was because I hadn't remembered until like I said when you when, when you when you get pushed back down to the third density or you go up in the fifth density in the density chamber it gives you almost like a like a temporary amnesia. So I didn't I didn't even remember until it was like halfway through. But he knew that like it like you said it, they can see into uh, timelines and stuff like that. And another reason was is like Robert said they were using you. He said, but you, you didn't mind, and he smiled. He said, well, you didn't mind in the sense that you know they're using my genetics. And they, they figured that I wouldn't, I was happy with the women I was at the time. I was with Leader and Swaru. And they figured that I wouldn't leave her. So, it, but if I was tempted with power or whatever, I would do it. And I did. And so they knew that that would be one of the only ways I'd be willing to do it. Yeah. To have so many wives, females, whatever you want to call it. But it was just, it was the point was, was they wanted my genetics in there. Because they have like, a, they're going through like a period, they've been around so long where their genetics are becoming kind of stagnant. And anytime they can find someone from a different world that's like genetically compatible with them, they take advantage of it. And it's like less than 2% of Earth. Is yeah, but besides, besides advantage taking, they, they, they also, there was also love. Actually, thank you, Elisa, for your donation and also Christina Love. Thank you so much. So, but there was also love with that. I mean, they felt also love for you. So I guess, you know, it's a two-way street. It's not just just like using you for genetics, right? And so- Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think maybe Robert was just being harsher about it because he did want me to go back in the chair. He didn't want me to think that, you know. And also, Svaru said to you not to go back in the chair so you would actually remember. So do you think- because they could have given you an implant so you would actually remember and they can communicate with you. Like, I mean, I know plenty of people that actually communicate with other beings. So then why not you? Why not communicate? I, 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 I've asked that myself. I've had a... May, I, I thought maybe it was something Aquino did. And I think maybe it's also maybe part of the contract where they really can't be involved with me until my 20 years. And I, I've, uh, oh, I, 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 but I remember Robert saying something like they can manipulate lower densities. Higher density beings can do things to manipulate lower density. So, like a fifth density being can cause like a series of events that can create an outcome, like in third density on Earth. And I, 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 I did wind up. Uh, meeting someone and she said her name is Anne Marie and she said that uh, I believe that that was kind of like a way of them manipulating our timeline to give me because I was at, I was pretty much in a bad bad way and things like that I was in bad shape and she's helped me a lot she's helped me write a book you, you brought up a book earlier and yeah hopefully by the time the conference comes up we'll be done with the book so. yeah also when you're 20 year back is over and you are back on the timeline from only your life maybe that's when they actually going to contact you that's what i'm thinking yeah yeah maybe maybe when it, maybe i'm done with my 20 years because i think it's almost just like something they can't really get involved they can't really yeah that makes sense too because to away, yeah. you, you still have to finish that timeline over there so it it does make... what robert kept on saying to me he kept on saying daryl you're still there and it, yeah it was like i couldn't get that that Did even you... the philosophy that philosophy now is still difficult to understand He's like, yeah you're still there you don't understand you're still there yeah it took me a while until i heard more stories and i thought well how does that work oh wait a minute hang on it's just because you being regressed back 20 years and so your whole life starts again, but the other one is still parallel next to it. And so 
you know, um, somebody asked, when is the Daryl's 20 years up? Uh, well, probably this spring, maybe, right? I believe this spring or next spring. But yeah, because like I said, like I said, I, I, I have another year. I have another year. You know, why are you thinking God, I here? definitely want to interview you after that, because I really want to <laughs> know how you feel, what's happening, because I do think that's going to be a major change in your life. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and maybe you get to go back as well. Uh, you don't know, uh, even if it's maybe occasionally. I mean, they're capable of getting you out of here for a moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst. I guess that's how I was raised. I'm hoping, but, you know. Yeah. I'll put all my, yeah, because I thought, well, aren't they missing you? But you're still there. So, no, they're I'm not still missing there. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the whole confusing part about time travel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah oh wow so fascinating but for you it's shitty because you got to do a whole 20 years again just to then wait till you're there where you were before which is well pretty frustrating i guess yeah yeah time loops are are, are scary and, and shitty as you said yeah at the same time it's like oh time is so relative isn't it because you know um it's like when you have to wait in line for, I don't know, the elevator, a minute can be really long. But when it's something, you know, in another occasion, a minute can be really quick. So it's all about how you actually live your life. So did you have children now in this timeline? No, no. And, and that was a big part of what Robert was telling me is just that, you know, he's, he, you know, somebody like you, he said, needs to have kids. He's like, you need to go back into the chair. He's like, you need to, you no. need to have children and stuff like that. And I, I don't said, agree. I, you know, I yeah. I, and, think, and he, and, yeah. I think he was more concerned about what you would remember than really about you having kids because you already have them. And when you remember them, you know, you're still bonded with them. So, you know, um, yeah. And he was more, yeah, I think he was more worried because I even confronted him about it, about me knowing what he did to me, even though he felt as though he didn't have a choice. He said that that's like a big, he was really big into balance. He called it the balance, like karma kind of thing. I guess if I would have got my mind wiped and I didn't realize he did that, I forgive him. I mean, it's, it's nothing. I'm not going to hold a grudge to the man. But uh, for a long time, I hated his guts and uh, well, not, not just for him doing that to me from taking me away from my family and everything else. And that was a big thing for him. It, it, he didn't want that balance or karma on him of me remembering that, you know, he was like a father to me and, you know, that happened, that wound up happening. So then when you were age around. regressed back, you still have to go. Oh, sorry. I've got, I've got a cat here next to me. I forgot about it, but um, you have to first live that timeline parallel in order to then remember it. So the children that you have are then not that old right now because, you know, you're still there. And so, because I thought, God, then you have 20 years of being homesick and missing them. But actually, that's not true because you still have to live it in order to miss it. Yeah, it, well, I mean, for the longest time, I don't know if it's because different abuses or what, but my mind can almost kind of just forget things. Yeah. I could just say, this is too difficult. I can't put up with this. Like I said, I had all these names written on a post-it note, and I was processing out in Norfolk, Virginia. That's where you process out in the Navy. And uh, I read this paper over and over again every day. And I did it in the morning. I did it at night. And I kept it in my wallet. And I read it and I read it and I read it. And all the names that Robert gave me. And I wrote them all down. And I just got to a point where I, I realized that, you know, if I keep on doing this, this is going to drive me crazy. I can't, I can't do this anymore. So I, I just threw the paper away. And I just had to convince myself, you know. It took a, one week. I remembered less and two weeks. And then by the fifth week, it was just like I didn't even remember it. And well, I know, I think I know why is because you start integrating in this timeline and on that old timeline, you just started. So it kind of makes sense. And just so the, the more time passes, the more you start remembering of what's happening because it start, you know, and I know it's freaking complicated for everybody to just keep up with all these timelines. But 
yeah, it makes total sense. It's not that torturous as you may think or as I thought it would be until I started thinking it through. And I'm like, all right, because, you know, because you lived over there in the last 10 years of the 20 years, right? Yeah, yeah, about the last 10 years. Yeah, I lived over there. I was going back and forth, I think, every now and again. I grew a beard. I remember that. That was one of the weird things when I woke up in the morning when I came back was I had like, like it was almost like somebody just went over with like a, a razor, like a clipper on my face. I had really thick beard and I, I, you know, I'm blonde. So I'm one of those people where it takes me a couple weeks to grow a, like even thing close to a full beard. And I had like this thick, like five o'clock shadow. And I was just like, what the heck is this? Like, I didn't know why I had such a, a thick beard. And yeah. And I didn't know why my, you know, my hair was, cut like a like somebody just cut it with clipper with like a number four or something like that they put a number four on clippers and I was yeah I didn't understand any of this stuff and I didn't have any memory of any of that at the time like you said and even I, I had dreams I had strange dreams that I couldn't understand and I went through a really bad bout of depression when I first got back and I think it was just because I missed my family like maybe my inner self knew yeah. that I was missing my family and I kept on having dreams of like blonde people like in blue uniforms and I didn't know what it was like a group of people just sta standing there and staring at me and just looking at me I kept on having this reoccurring dream like that and I didn't know what it was but I went through just like an awful depression for about a month yeah I can imagine yeah because I guess it's I guess it must be a cell memory as well it makes sense right oh yeah it, it definitely yeah like on a DNA level yeah on a cell yeah. level yeah of course so you also had certain things that were told to you that would happen in the future. And, um, well, they all came out, but anything from after the, like later on, for example, well, now, yeah. this time, this moment. Well, I, like I, like I said, um, he was seeing things through my timeline and everything like that. And he noticed that I think the January, what was it, 8th or whatever it was with DC. That's, I think that's yes. when he said when uh, JFK Jr. was supposed to come out or something like that. And then he oh, was really? alive the whole time. Yeah, he, he said that JFK Jr. did a walk around the plane, like a safety walk around. And he said he saw the gear, the, uh, the wires hanging out of the landing gear of the bomb. And then they, they flew it remotely and blew it up that way. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Like I said, he told me, yeah, he told me Trump was going to be president. And it was almost like a back to the future kind of thing where I was like, Ronald Reagan is going to be president. And I was like, the billionaire, like the actor, you know what I mean? I was like, really? Right, right. And, and yeah, he was telling me just all this bonkers stuff. But yeah, so he did told he me, tell you that JFK Jr. would come back? Yeah, yeah. He told, he told me, he said that people think that uh, Michael Jackson and Diana are going to come back. But they're not. They're dead. Yeah. He said. But he said. But JFK Jr. He's still alive, and he's just been in, in hiding. And I, that's how I remember that because I like asked him about Michael Jackson and stuff like that. And uh, I, that, that that's how I remember that. I have that memory of because he told me a lot of stuff that I probably forgot. I was in the office with the guy for like an hour, and it was just wave after wave after wave of things he was telling me. He t I told the last guys I was on the last show that I, I forgot to mention was. Uh, he told me that the uh, Library of Alexandria was uh, when they burned it down, when Caesar burned it down, that he actually took all the books and all the scrolls and all the tablets. And he said that it's in the catacombs of the Vatican and it's all going, going to be released and it's going to change everything. He says, our entire history is going to change. He said, he told me that, you know, evolution is nonsense and we, we really are like the, uh, the our Atlanteans, are our ancestors and things like Atlantis was real, he told me, and we're, of the Atlanteans were our ancestors and all this other stuff. And he, yeah, I mean, did he, he say me, when, like, if JFK Jr. comes back, then what it depends on and in what capacity? What it depends on. Well, that's the thing is, like I said, they can they can prolong things, is how he put it. He says, but once he says Project Looking Glass, it's like he says it's locked. He said I've been to the future and I've seen. He's been way past this future and he's seen our our eventual different timelines but he said it can be prolonged but it can't be stopped right and i think that's what's happening right now and i mean people and he said like you're going to see things and it's not going to be that obvious but it's going to be pretty obvious i mean the the the, the prince of, of england just got what his his 
his uh, whatever his monarchy taken away, and he got his, all his royal records and everything. That's a big deal. I, I mean, people don't understand like that's huge, especially like being prior military. I mean, I, I can only imagine if I was English, that would be like whole, that would be like well, life changing. I'm quite surprised what's happening in in the new year. We have the Voice of Holland, which the Voice that program were and it's worldwide was actually invented in Holland. So now they closed it down because a big like Pandora's box opened of sexual abuse, um, uh, sexual misconduct with people. So they had to take it off the television. We have these celebrities hiding everywhere because they are all being exposed right now as we speak. So it's very interesting what is happening. I do believe that this year is going to be that year where everything is going to be out in the open. And where are they? Like during this whole pandemic, it's like, why isn't Johnny Depp on TV telling me to wear a mask or get a shot? Celebrities are always putting their nose in your business on yes. commercials and stuff like that. All of a sudden, where are, all these, where are they? Where are they at? They are all, all these- vanished ever since yeah. the whole pandemic started, right? And I and wonder. Think about that, yeah. It's like I did. There I've been is, thinking- like, things happening all the time. It's going yeah. to. He even said it's World War Three. He's like, we're in a war. He's like, it's going to take time. We're in an actual war. He's like, we yeah. we, we could have fought it, you know. In, in, in everybody's faces and there would be massive amounts of casualties and things and there would be civil war and strife and starvation and things like that so they're gonna they're trying to do it more under the radar and it's going to take longer but it, it is going to happen you know and yeah there will be okay. less there's yeah. less casualties that way right so but yeah. did you get any predictions on how it will go in Europe because you know you see in Australia New Zealand um, Europe especially all this uprising going on right now um, I'm mass and so I wonder if he told you something about it well yeah that's well that was a huge thing he said was uh, the people have to do it themselves they have to want it they can't just like sit back and let it happen for them so all these riots and uprisings and everything else, these, this is what they want. This is a good thing. He said that it has to affect the people at a DNA level. As we were talking about earlier, like a, a cellular, it has to be ingrained in our DNA that we can't just watch football and watch soccer and not worry about our leadership and not, you know, not even think about anything that involves our life. We have to become, we have to become part of this. We have to make sure this doesn't happen again. We just can't lay back and let this, the, the, our rulers just do whatever they want to us as we did before. You know, we, ha- we this has to just completely change our DNA in a sense, our DNA memory in a sense. You know? So the people, he said, yeah, the people, they have to uh, riot and uprise and things like that. And you have all these people, you know, in the United States, you know, the people that are just going before school boards and they're just telling like, they're all just not, you're, you're full of crap. People are going to town halls and just screaming at these people because they're, yeah. you know, it's insane. And they're letting them know like, Hey, you're going to, you're going to be executed for this. There's like, you know, parents that are standing up just telling yeah. school board members like, look, you're going to be executed for this. You don't understand. Yeah. And I see it. Somebody it's said so that to the, to the prime minister of Canada, right? Oh God. Like, yeah. I just, yeah, yeah. The truckers over there. And you know what? I'm, and I see it happening everywhere right now. I think in the span of two months, God, the world is going to look different already because, you know, I do see it all happening at once right now and slowly, but at once. And you know how that goes. It's a domino effect, right? Yeah. Yeah. What do they call that? The the monkeys or whatever? The, the Oh, that's a hundred monkey. monkey effect. I was thinking about that, too, because at the end of the day, that's within your DNA. And so if you start to do an uprising or just plainly say, I'm not going to participate with this anymore. I do think that is has a hundred monkey effect as well. At a certain point, all over the world, everybody's like, "Yeah, I'm not going to participate with this anymore," right? Yeah, like in a sense, we yeah, we you, that's evidence that we do share a consciousness that you know there is like a, a one being kind of consciousness that we all share. And once enough of us smarten up and wisen up, the entire yes. world it'll cause a, a chain reaction where the entire world will, will wisen up to this. You know these these people are insane. We, we we can't have like leaders like this. We can't have leadership like this any longer. Because I do see many many people are still not awake. They're so asleep. But what what I know 
as of this week, at first I was like, ah, oh, all these divisions and when are people going to wake up and, you know, but now I'm seeing, no, no, no. They still, they just only have to catch up with us because I do believe those that are awake are now in the majority, like majorly in the majority. And there was a, a huge thing for me was there was a woman, I think they call them progressives, which is kind of like a ra radical kind of left kind of person. She wrote for uh, New York Times, which is very, you know, like a left wing magazine. Get all your, and she even said like, I got all my shots and I wore all my mask all the time. And I cleaned my clothes every time I got home. Like, you know, it was a hazmat lab and stuff yeah. like that. <laughs> and now she's starting to say like, now we know that these masks don't do anything, you know, the yes. vaccines don't do anything, nothing, you know, all of this is just nonsense. And it's just, it's garbage, I see the, you know? I see the mainstream media slowly tipping toward the other side, like, wait, what, what are we doing here? Right. And it's so visible as of this, this new year, it literally shifted. It's amazing how that, how quickly that can go because I have to say two months ago, I was still depressed and I thought, you know what? I have no faith in this anymore, <laughs> but now I kind of do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely good news. That's for yeah. sure. Like everything I see on TV now is good news. Yeah, yeah, even yes. like even, even the more liberal, like CNN and stuff, they're kind of having to, yes. you know, eat crow. they're, 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 they're kind of having to tell people like, yeah, this, Masks don't do anything, and you know, because at, at first they told you what was it? Fauci said it doesn't matter if you wear a mask; it's not going to do anything. You don't buy masks; you'll just take them away from doctors. But then it was like, now you got to wear three masks. And yeah, I don't know why people didn't understand. Like, why did you know he when he changed what he said? Like, why didn't anybody get that? You know, like, it's like I, they, I think, yeah, it's like they all of a sudden had spontaneous amnesia because it was also said that it wasn't too dangerous for children and children should not be vaccinated. And all of a sudden, it's children needs to be back. And I'm like. What's happening to people that it what well, did it just pass their mind or is it like all of a sudden they have selective amnesia? I don't know how that works, but I do remember what was said. Mm -hmm. And and that's part of what you know. That's what's changing us. Like I said, it, we we can't have a mindset like that where you know if if somebody tells you something, remember. You know, don't just forget what somebody said. It, 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 once they, you know, change what they said, you know, they're a liar. They're liars now, you know. So, you know, don't, 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 you know what I mean? Like if, if yeah. a guy tells you one thing a year ago and then, then he tells you something else now, then, you know, be yeah. skeptical but don't believe him. So were you told about what, what's going to happen with the whole system? Because I do believe the whole system needs to collapse in order to, um, you know, change the world. And so, like you said, when everything is still there from the Alexandria Library at the Vatican, uh, I believe the Vatican already collapsed. They just don't let us know yet. But, you know, or did, were you told that the whole system is going to collapse and that there's going to be a different system? Yeah, it, it, we're going to have to be. He, yeah, we're going to have to go through a depression, but they're going to try to make it as quickly as possible and it, we're already kind of going through it right now i know in the states i mean gas is ridiculous i went to the grocery store the other day there's no chicken you know what? I, I had to buy stew meat you know like because it was the cheapest thing and then like steak is ridiculous so it's like i'm living off stew meat because it's 30 30 dollars for a steak you know i mean chicken is ridiculous wow. but i mean yeah he, he said it, it's gonna have to fall and collapse and he said it's going to be more of like a, a gold-based system. He, and he even told me about the uh, septillion that, that was in the uh, the catacombs of the Vatican. He said there's a septillion worth of gold yeah. in the catacombs. He said it's enough to make everybody on earth a hundred millionaire. And I said, well, is everybody going to be a hundred millionaire? And he said, no, nobody would work. He said, we can't do that. He said, nobody would, there would be no incentive to work. But he said that, uh, yeah, he said that once it happens, um, he said, like, you know, even like a janitor is going to be able to take like a 30 day vacation with his family on a cruise. He said it's going to be better than like the mid 50s of the economy. It's going to be just unreal. Yeah. Like, you know, everybody. I, I remember he said about debts and things like that. I said, are debts going to be a race? He said, no, he, he said that wasn't going to happen. He said, but you're going to be able to pay it off pretty quick because your money's going to be worth so much. And uh okay. Yeah, yeah, many people talk about that Nazara Jazara thing. Um, you know, um, 
I think things need to collapse in order for that to even start because, you know, people are not responsible, right? Everybody has been impoverished so badly. They all want to be millionaires. And when they are, then they're going to indeed be sitting back and say, bye, you know, nobody. So in order to get that balance back as, you know, everybody participating within society, you know, it's kind of a bad thing to all of a sudden take away money yeah well it's a bad thing to just throw money at people too like you said but i think the entire culture is going to change is what he was saying too you know just the whole tiktok and nonsense like that and and credit cards you know uh, usury banking and things like that he said that's going to be a thing of the past he said that there are going to be loans and things like that but there's no they're going to be interest free you're going to have to pay them back and things like that but it's things like inflation you know, because interest usury leads to inf- inflation. So, infl- you know, usury is going to be just a thing of the past, but you are going to be able to get loans out, but you are going to have to pay them back. But he just talked about how the entire culture itself is going to change. It's just going yeah. to be less. Well, I see that because if you look now, like I said, a month back, I was still depressed and I thought this is not going to go well. And here we are a month later and I'm completely optimistic as I see stuff changed so that's how quickly things can change and therefore i think a a whole a whole world a whole system can change that quick because after all i guess people just need to suffer enough to in order for for it to want to change yeah and he and he he mentioned med beds and things like that too he he said it's all going to be a thing of the past sickness yeah, cancer, things like that. Life expectancy is going to go up. The birth defects, deformities, all that stuff. It's just, he says they're going to release it. It's not going to be a trickle, he said, but they're going to release it quick enough to where, you know, within our generation, it will happen. But he oh, said, really? it was, yeah, yeah. He said it's going to, and now he didn't mention anything about, he didn't mention, I, I think I even said something about, you know, will we ascend the fifth density or something? Because that's like the, the big thing. And he kind of like dodged that question. Uh, maybe he didn't want me to know, or maybe he just didn't want to bring it up. But he did was he was really adamant about just all the ET tech, the healing technology that we have. It'll all be brought like to the public. And it, 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 it's not going to happen overnight, but, you know, months, maybe years, that it's going to start bringing one thing out, out over another, over another, another, another. Right. Right. In a way, we already have certain alternative things that, you know, like sound, like regression, stuff like, you know, it's still primitive compared to um, what could be. But that's how everything starts, isn't it? So, I mean, I don't make use of doctors anymore. I don't trust them. There's no pharmaceutical that goes in my body anymore. So, you know, I changed completely in that sense in in well, not a few years, but it was over time. But at the same time, I do not. Uh, I now see it that if I need a doctor, I'm fucked. You know, that's kind of how I see things because the poison they put in your body and all that. So I, I won't go in a hospital. I, I think that is actually more dangerous than not going. So, you know, it's, it's interesting how things slowly start to shift. Yes, yes, I like I haven't, yeah, like, I just hate hate wearing a mask. And every hospital makes you wear a mask, so. Yeah, I, I never, I never like wore it. <laughs> I just literally ignore it. I don't make it part of my reality. I walk in, and funny enough, people look at me like, you know, like there's no difference. Like, it's not a big deal. And I haven't worn it at all. Well, everybody's wearing it, but nobody is treating me differently over it. And it's me because I'm not afraid how they're going to treat me over it. So I'm just ignoring it. Right. Yeah. And like, like, you know, like we were saying, just even the most staunch believers in the mask and everything else, they're starting to wake up and, yeah. you know, nobody likes a, I told you so. So everybody. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. I see a lot of that now that people yeah. say yeah, and this and that, and then they're still pride, proud because you know, yeah, they definitely want to, don't want to be said. And I don't think we should tell them I told you so, because at the end of the day, we were asleep once. Yeah. And so I guess we need to give them time to wake up as well, I guess. Although it is fun to say, I told you so, but you know, you don't want to make it an ego thing anyway, because that's how we evolve. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, and nobody is nobody's innocent in this. You know, we we all let this happen. You know, we all have to have some sort of accountability for this on some level. Yeah. So you know, everybody was just kind of asleep at one time. Yeah. So yeah, 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 have some empathy for people that you know they just watch too much TV. <laughs> yeah, I'm so curious how it's going to be for you when you are out of there at the 20 years and back because. I'm, I definitely want to know what it will be like. We've actually have talked for two hours. That went quick. What happened? Yeah. Oh, did we have a change of clock? No, we didn't. Oh my gosh, two hours. So, you know, I definitely want to talk to you again when you feel that, okay, I got back. And uh, I just want to know the changes that uh, are you going through. And uh, yeah, maybe if you can get to be in touch with them. Of course, of course. Yeah. Keep so, in touch. where is um? Uh, you you did write a book, right? No, in, in the process. Oh, it's in the process. Okay. Yes. So, oh yeah, you said that you are planning to have it out when you are going to the conference in yes. May. It is, I believe. So, for those people that are interested and are in the US that want to go, I really want to go, but I'm not in the US unfortunately, and uh, I don't have a portal at my disposal, but otherwise I would be going. But um, yeah, um, I also put your website in the description. So is there any other place that people can find you? Oh, no, just Daryl D. James on the website. Yeah. And yeah, it's May 2nd to the 6th. Oh, yeah. And in Grafton, uh, Illinois. Grafton, Illinois. Yeah. All right. Well, who knows? Maybe I can still go. Depends. Things move really quickly. So thank you so much for coming and uh, and for your story. Obviously, I mean, you can speak for hours, but yeah, I hope people will check out also the other interviews he's done because they are really fascinating. Absolutely. With James Rink and with Journeys to Truth, that pretty much covers a lot of what you've um, you know experienced. So um, thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Also, I'm going to be back on Thursday and I'm going to talk about the topic, uh, gen um, what's it called, transgender and um, with a roundtable. It's going to be very interesting. Also, for those that are not interested in transgenders, but it's very fascinating to hear about what's going on with that. So thank you all. And uh, yeah, peace out all. I'll see you Thursday.